Amen. Everyone, uh, when you're there at Luke 21, everyone say amen. amen. Oh, I'm not even there. I can't say amen. Okay, Luke 21, and we're going to look at uh, verse 1. Before we do, let's just go ahead and pray real fast. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we learn out of your word, Father, but you are the one that brings understanding to us. Father, I pray that you... Uh, bring more understanding to the church. Uh, this is a word, Lord, that has been shared many times inside of your true churches, Lord. Help it to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Luke 21, uh, verse 1. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow had cast in more than they all. We're going to continue down to verse 4. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury, that is lack, her lack, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. And the word there, the word you want to look at there is in all the living that she had. I know this scripture is used many times when it comes to um, tithes and offerings. And many people will use this right here. But Jesus uses this in many different layers. And if you notice here when he said in all the living that she had, that's what we're going to focus on inside of this sermon. So... The title of my message is called uh, Resistance to Resolved. Resistance to Resolved. Now, I had spoke in a sermon in the past about self-willed Christians, and uh, just to touch on it a little bit, self-willed typically refers to someone who is stubborn, obstinate, or determined to have their own way, often without consideration for others' opinions or advice. Amen. So it's very impossible to be a self-willed Christian. I said that before. Uh, which is why it, it's quite an oxymoron for you to be a self-willed Christian. Uh, and the easiest way to spot one of them, as I said before in the sermon, I'm just touching over some things real fast, is uh, not only are their actions off, but their actions uh, aren't based on the Word of God, or they use self-experience as the level to get to. Well, I think that, you know, uh, you shouldn't preach that way because, you know, it, it's, it's, offen it's offensive to them, but they paint it up as maybe you're not going to reach a lot of people if you preach that way. Or someone might say, well, in all my years of doing this, I have done this. So they use their self-experience over the words, or they use words like, I feel, yeah. I think, replace words of, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Or what the Bible says. Yet, and something, and as I read through the word, I saw this many times. Yet, when I, uh, when I read, uh, when you read in Hebrews and much in Judges, because in Judges, there was a lot of men who did things that went against the norm. They challenged things. They went forth. And it, it always used to make me wonder uh, what caused them to continue to do this and this not be self-willed. This not be a certain sort of self-will. And we hear it out on the streets a lot all the time. Well, hey, you're only doing this for your own good work. So you're telling me if I don't preach like you, then I'm not saved and things like that. And I'm not getting into preaching. I'm not getting into self-willed. I'm, I'm getting into what would one term this thing that we do? What would one term it when we ourselves are persistent in something? When we go forward and what we're doing, when we're very fired up about what we're doing, when we know this is true. And as you'll see, um, uh, so what is the driving force? What is it when a man, when he, uh, just like Paul, when he proposes in the spirit to get to Rome? Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat and his wine. Uh, 
uh, Psalm 119, 112. You don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to go there. I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statues always, even unto the end. That sounds almost self-willed and presumptuous if you just look at it in that way. Mm. But what this is, or, or how can David, another one I love, and I read it all the time, and I think about it, and I meditate on it, which goes against you know, we're born sinners and all of that, is when David said about his little child who God killed because of uh, David's wickedness, how can David say when his son died, he can't come to me, but I must go to him. That sounds very much like David was going to do things in his own will to get to him, but, it, but it's not that. So if it's not self-willed, what would one want to call it? So, uh, uh, the word you want to use is resolved. Amen. Resolved. As in, not resolve, like get it done, but resolved, it's already been done yeah. and confirmed. Okay, so I'll give you the definition of resolve. Having made a firm decision or commitment to do something, or it could also refer to having determined a solution to a problem or having reached a conclusion about something after careful consideration or deliberation. Resolved. The word of God is resolved. Amen. It's determined to be the only way one is a Christian or society or a household or the church or kingdom is supposed to live by. It is the only resolved thing in this world on this earth man's word isn't god's word is it's resolved i want to make it clear that the lord is resolved uh to cast the wicked into hell it's resolved Amen. it's already been spoken he's going to do it uh he is resolved to have the perfect in heaven yeah. he's resolved to do that his law is resolved and i understand uh, the, cerem the ceremonial parts and all of those, those were a shadow of things to come. Those are no longer there. The Lord already came and died. But the rest of his moral law, all of those things are still around. It's resolved. It is the best way to live. If Jesus Christ was on earth and he was in human flesh, which he was, how would he live? How would he live? What would he do? How would he do this? How would he do that? And that's where the law comes in. As a Christian, as we follow Christ, uh, it is important for us to resolve, have resolved in ourselves what we're going to do in the Lord. It's confirmed, it's done. And always, just like as everything that is resolved, there comes resistance or conflict. And so the simple question is, well, when should a Christian resist? The moment they get saved, there should be resistance automatically. When you get saved, you are saying, after deliberate consideration and all of these things, that you no longer are going to go that way in life. You are now going to go forward in what the Word says. You're resolved. It's resolved. This is how I'm going to do. I'm going to get to heaven. That's resolved. It's done. Yeah. Therefore, it comes, uh, there comes some com conflict. So if someone feels that a decision has been imposed upon them without their input or consideration... It is known as resistance. Yeah. There's going to be resistance. Uh, if the re resolution conflicts with their beliefs, values, or interests, or lust, they may resist it. Why people don't stay in the church? Uh, because it's not resolved in them to do what the Lord wants. Yeah. And it's plain and simple. It's not new. It's not some secret. We may not know exactly if why this person left, why this person did this, why this person shut why this pe people over here are talking bad about us or whatever, it's simple. It's because it's resolved in us to do the Lord's will and it doesn't benefit their interests, their values, their beliefs, their lust, or anything like that. Let's turn to Luke uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 17. We'll start there. This is, and this is all that happens when a city, a household, a kingdom, or individual is not resolved to walk after the Lord. This uh, portion of scripture hits all of them pretty uh, pretty straightforward. <clears throat> but he, this Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, 
Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Bezalel. And if I by Bezalel cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. And here's where I want you to look at right here. Because uh, someone has to hold authority. It has to be resolved on someone's end. And here's how the world resolves it right here. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. So when it's not resolved in a man who has uh, authority over his household, how he's going to walk in that house and do the things that that house requires, thinking it's just in the natural, I'm going to be armed. But guess what? When a stronger person than you who's armed and comes into that house, they get it taken away. When a stronger nation that's not uh, who comes against you to America, what they're going to, they're going to come in stronger than you because the nation is not resolved to follow the laws of God. And where God doesn't, and when there's no resolution to follow God, then God's not there at all. Therefore, you get overtaken by someone else who's stronger than you in the areas you think you are stronger in. Yeah. And that's the bottom line. But we're going to keep reading. Um, verse uh, 23. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth, gathereth not with me scattereth. Therefore, he is that who's not resolved is in resistance. And any resistance is going to, at some point, resistance has to come to a conclusion, which is a, a revolt. It has to happen. Whether they revolt against God, and God's going to revolt against them. Adam and Eve were resistant against God's word. God revolted, kicked them out of heaven, and it was resolved. It was resolved. You and your house, if someone is sinning inside of your house, uh, there's resistant. It's not going to be for long. It's resolved. Get them out of there. Someone inside of the church is acting up, sinning. It's going to be resolved. The pastor's going to kick them out, and so on and so forth. Therefore, you cannot sit amongst those who aren't resolved with you in the same spirit to do the things of the Lord. It's just not going to happen. It's impossible. I'll give an analogy. My daughter, um, she's real little. She poops because uh, she eats solid food, and her poop stinks so bad. And for me to keep that diaper around me while I just go through life is unbearable. It needs to get away from me. I'm going, I'm revolt, I'm revolted by it. I'm going to take it and I'm going to cast it from me and it's resolved. Yeah. Resolved. So how can a Christian hang or be around things that are not resolved to do, the, not confirmed, not ready to walk in the ways of the Lord? Either they're going to be revolted by you, they're going to think you stink and it's you that's doing it and so they got to leave or you're going to kick them out. Yeah, one or the other. One or the other. It's that simple. Verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him, him, take to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. You will not be able to go through life and think I can just go back to the things that I was doing before with just uh, partly resolved in a certain area. Maybe your finances might be resolved in one thing. Maybe this, maybe I got a better job, maybe I, but I can just go back to those things. If you're not resolved in your heart to do the things of the Lord, it's going to be worse from you at the end than it was before. Because mm -hmm. God can't allow it. God cannot allow you to continue in that way. He's holy. God is resolved. You're going to lose. And that's the end of the story. So I ask you in this room. Um, oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me back up. Did I jump ahead? 
Oh, I know. Okay, let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Here's where I was going with it. So there's a few things that kills uh, resolve more than anything. And one of those is expectation. Your earthly expectation or the world's earthly things and the cares of this world, they call it the cares of this world. But your expectations, your self-willed expectations will kill your resolve to walk with the Lord every single time. Amen. Matthew chapter 11. Oh, there's a lot of 11s. I just noticed that. 11. I didn't do that on purpose. 11 verse 1. And we're going to go to 8. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And you guys... Uh, a lot of people try to twist this and things like that and say, oh, John, he wasn't believing. But it wasn't for John. This was for John's disciples, not for John. And John, being a great pastor, a great leader, understood that when he sent them to someone, he didn't have to worry if they were true sheep, first of all, yeah. if the person they were sending them to were going to steer them the wrong way. Yeah. But this was not so. John knew that was the, he knew Christ. He knew the Messiah and he was sending them for their own beliefs. Hey, you guys go ask him. Why are you asking me? I'm in prison. You go ask him. Two of you already went and followed him. Why are you guys still here? Uh, verse, so I just want to make that clear. Verse three, and said unto him, art thou he that should come or do we look for another? This is what the disciples are saying. Hey, John sent us here and this is what we're asking. Verse four, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and shew John again those things which ye do hear and see. Uh, what, what did Jesus say? Go and show him again. So these guys have been back more. This is the second time, third, maybe the fourth time that they've been here. So they had some expectations. They didn't get it the first time. And therefore God said, uh, uh, Go again to John and tell him what you see. When you make someone confess something or say it out loud, to someone else or teach something, you'll understand it better. This is why a lot of, that's why questions are asked in Christianity. You'll notice Jesus discipling asked many questions because he wanted to hear them. Or maybe he asked a question that he knew the answer to because he wanted to see how they were going to teach it back to him. This is why we uh, ask our children, hey, did you take out the trash? Yes, I did. How? Oh, I went through that door and, and to see if they got it, if they're listening or understanding. So Jesus said, go back and tell him again. Verse five, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them and blessed is he whomsoever shall not be offended in me. Now this wasn't telling them what they saw. This was Jesus adding on to the end and blessed are those who are not offended. You know the reason why people have some expectations? Because they're offended. That's why, yeah. because they have some false expectation of what things are supposed to be because they're not resolved in their heart to follow after the Lord. So they have these expectations. And when their expectations aren't fulfilled, then they begin to get offended. Yeah. Verse seven. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Verse 8. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So Jesus said, what did you guys go out and see? Yeah, a reed shaken. You saw John. What did you go out expecting to see? What are you expecting to see from God? And do your expectations line up with the will of God? Or do you think you deserve more than what God has already supplied to you? Do you think you deserve more than salvation? Do you think you deserve more than what God has already done throughout history? Hey, the Lord is coming back. Amen. You read this word and it's like, wow, they had God walking amongst them. And just like the uh, song we heard today, uh, will, will the Lord dwell with us again? Yes. And it would suck to miss it because your expectations are different than what 
the Lord is going to do. So what are your expectations of the Lord? Do you think you not deserve to be spit on? You don't deserve to have your name slandered. You don't deserve to be killed. You don't deserve to have your children taken away. And again, I'm not saying that you deserve those things. That's not what I'm saying. But don't think you're so far above reproach because that's why you became a Christian that you expect other things. And when they're not happening, then it's, it's the Lord's fault. You might not say it. What you'll say instead is, oh, well, you know, um, maybe I shouldn't have said that to that individual. Maybe we shouldn't have preached over there. Maybe you should have just compromised with the court rulings. Maybe you should have just done this or that. Why did you go back to that campus, Pastor Aiden? Why did we go back there? We knew they said this. Those are the things you'll begin to say. So, if your personal peace is disturbed, it's because, or, or your, uh, or you think you should be rich and your business collapse or things like that, it's not because you deserve anything. It's because you're not resolved in it. You're not resolved in the word of God. You're not resolved to the end. Let's look at some people who are resolved to do opposite to the Lord's way. And it's a shame that the heathen and their wickedness are more resolved to do wickedness than the Christians are resolved to do the Lord's work. You think people were getting tortured, sawn asunder, ripped away from their loved ones because they just went preaching? (laughs) They wanted all of the law of God. And if it went against man's law, therefore we are now in resistance to their law. So what? Should we compromise and get back right in? Or should rebellion and resistance continue until there's a revolt? The kingdom of heaven does suffer violence still to this day. As soon as Satan was cast out of heaven, therefore as soon as you become a Christian... You are now no longer in resistance towards God. You're in resistance towards the enemy on God's side. But the moment you were born, your life was always meant to have resistance in it. Whether it's resistance to God, assuming you're not in a Christian household, or you are a Christian and it's resistance to the devil. But things don't come resolved. It can be resolved in you, but as long as you're on this earth, things are not resolved entirely inside this earth until... Uh, we have the enemies underneath our feet, like the Lord said. Amen. Or we cast them under his feet, bring all those before him. So it's not resolved. But if a man wants to see that revolt happen, it first needs to be resolved in his own life what he's going to do. So the people who are not resolved to the Lord's ways, and a lot of times we can look at the ones who did good, but we also need to look at the ones who have done wickedly and see how they press and keep going. Yeah. Balaam. I'm just going to name some. Balaam. Yeah. So Balaam, we understood that he had uh, he was trying to go after God's people. His donkey stops him, and he did not just stop there. Then he tried to figure it out. How do I go about that? How do I go around? How do I get, uh, how do I just bring them down? And as a Christian, do you meditate on those things? How can I follow God all the way? How do I have it resolved in my own life when no one's looking, when no one's around? Is it resolved in me that I'm going to follow God no matter what? That I'm going to turn my eyes from this or that? Resistance should be, uh, there's three types, okay? There's resistance, which is, hey, I'm just going to turn my eyes from that wickedness over there. I don't want to look at any bad movies. I'm not going to read any bad books. Resistance is the base level that a Christian can get, resistance. Then there is rebellion, and rebellion is an outward action. The mother is trying to talk to the daughter, and the daughter turns and walks away. Rebellion. The mom says to the daughter to do something. The daughter does not do it. That is rebellion. And then we get to the third phase, revolt. Now something needs to change, and my will is going to go over your will until this, the final stage, the end of it, resolved, is how we would say it. At the very least, every baby Christian should be resistant. Yeah. At the very least. So many of that we've said, and I've taken it back, now I'm like, uh, because it's not about knowledge. It's not. I have a little daughter. 
and she resists things she doesn't like automatically. I don't have to teach her. It's not in her head. If she doesn't like, I don't know what she doesn't like. If she doesn't like peaches, she's going to spit it out. And not only is she going to spit it out, now she's marked it and recognized it. I know those are peaches. I don't want them anymore. That is what a baby does. So a baby should be automatically resistant to the things that are wrong. It doesn't matter how much knowledge they have. They haven't been in the word. They can't take you through the, you know, Hebrews and all this. They should automatically at the very least be resistant. So I've been wrong in the past where I've called people that are just flat out not saved as babies. Because even a baby desires what's sincere. Isn't that what Paul said? They desire the sincere milk. My baby doesn't want any of this and that they wanted sincere milk when they were little when they were crying they knew what they wanted secondly rebellion should be also in every christian who continues to learn in this word your knowledge that you read should get to rebellion what did it do to josiah as soon as he saw the law it was rebellion we need to take action right now and what was his action get everyone else on board that was a rebellion that's why we preach we go out, we preach. That is our rebellion to them, our rebellion towards the uh, world. And there's other forms of rebellion that we do. Obviously, I won't say it on camera, but there's other forms of rebellion that we do because we understand at some point when God judges America, we are going to get to the revolt side yeah. of it. Amen. And again, we won't talk about that on camera, but there's a revolt side to it. Amen. And then when the Lord comes back, not even if we're able to get Pennsylvania and all of that, uh, New York, whatever it is, under God's dominion or God's law coming, it's still not going to be resolved until the Lord comes back. So yes, a Christian for very much of his whole life is rebelling against the enemy. Well, what happens if, if there's pushback? Because there is going to be pushback. There's always pushback. Amen. Then we push back harder. Only one side is going to be resolved. There's no two winners. Right. There's no two winners. America thought they were the strongest country because they did things years ago. You think those other countries are fine with that? Sure. You think China and Russia were fine with that? <laughs> you think they're like, just take their butt whipping and say, oh, well, we'll never try that again. Mm. Now, again, I'm not getting into politics or anything like that, but there has to be one winner. That's it. And so, yes, uh, yes, that's why many people drive themselves from us, whether it be your own family, whether it be things on the job, it doesn't matter. You should be in full rebellion at this point if you're calling yourself a Christian for six years, five years, three years, two years, it doesn't matter. I would much rather have a bunch of babies who are resistant than ones that call themselves, I've been Christian for 10 years, but can't even rebel. Yeah. Still doing the same old things they were doing back then. Just, hey, say amen or Jesus every now and then, and it's okay. At the very least, at the very least, babies should be resistant. Amen. Uh, let's turn back to Luke uh, chapter 21. Again, like I said, I know this is, uh, this is not new with us in the church, but it's a good reminder, a good refresher, especially as times are how they are. We always need a refresher as time goes on. So, um, now, I understand right here in verse 21 what we're about to get into, and we'll start uh, in verse 6, but I understand uh, we're historicists in this church, and again, I'm not getting into eschatology or anything like that. Um, I understand many of this stuff did happen and there's still things that are double prophecy and stuff will happen later. Amen. But what I will say is for the stuff that did happen, this was a blueprint for a lot of the um, disciples during that time or people who were believing back then to get through it. So if it was good enough for them, because there's nothing new under the sun, if it was good enough for them, then this is good enough for us. Uh, let's go, uh, let's start in verse 6. We're going to read quite a bit of scripture here. Uh, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come 
and the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, and this is the first one, Take heed that ye be not deceived. So church, we are going to be resolved that we are not deceived. That is a confirmation for you to deliberately know I am not going to be deceived. And we'll continue in verse 8. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. And here's the next one coming up. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. Mm -hmm. So we are going to resolve, have resolved in ourselves to not be terrified. Again, I understand this is, uh, again, I'm talking about in the context of all of Christianity as we see the times approaching and things like that. We're going to have these in our hearts. Let's go down to, actually, I just, I love this whole thing. We'll keep reading. <clears throat> For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Verse 10. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. That's why he's saying, don't be terrified. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you. This sounds like uh, the Lord is uh, breaking down their expectations right here. Yeah. They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. These things will be a testimony for you. Verse fourteen. Here it is. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. So I am going to be resolved to settle these things in my heart. Settle it and not meditate before on the things I'm going to answer. And we've had to go before judges many times. Mm -hmm. I have it. It's in our hearts. No, we're not going to back down. No, your orders are unlawful. According to the law of God, every single one of man's uh, orders are unlawful. Let's move on. Uh, we're going to... Um, no, we'll keep going. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And this is because they have it, you have it settled in your heart. This is why people can't gainsay the things you are saying. Therefore, they have to go to the past or go here or go there or how you talk to that person there. This is why they have to turn to humanism to try to get you in trouble. Yeah. Verse 16, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. Verse 19, here it is again. Have this resolved. In your patience, possess ye your souls. Possess ye your souls and your patience. So I'm going to be resolved to have patience and not be hasty on these things. And again, it's not about saving your own life, but you are going to possess your soul how you react to it. We talked about happiness inside adult Sunday school. We're going to possess it. And patience. Uh, verse 20, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let's get down to verse 20. Uh, so a lot of this is still going. We're talking about Jerusalem falling with the sword. Others are going to die. And then we're going to get down to verse 28. And when these things began to come to pass... Here it is. Then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. When times seem to get the worse, when they're at the very worst, you guys need to lift up your eyes. We're going to lift up our heads. I resolve to always pray, to keep my head up, to not mope around like we talked about. I'm going to lift up my eyes, because if your eyes are always down and you're not looking up, you're going to run into something. Amen. Always look up. Even during all the time. So that's your resolve right there. I'm resolved that I'm always going to look up towards the Lord. No matter how much things are going on around. To see how we're going to handle this situation. Amen. 
And I'm going to lift my head when I do it. Let's, uh, let's skip down to um, verse 34. And here's another one. Again, the Lord says this, but this is a different take heed. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Uh, that surfeiting words is uh, almost like a merry drunkenness, um, like merry fool. Um, so pretty much he's talking about here, uh, again, the cares of this life, the drunkenness and all that. You can be drunk by a lot of things, not just alcohol. You can be drunk on the nice food that you're eating. You can be drunk on life. You can be drunk on the atmosphere you're in. Oh, God's in this place. I really feel it here. I'm just, hey, I mean, I knew that church was wrong over here, but I'm here and I'm just, oh, this place and these feelings and I just feel the presence and I'm heavy and I'm drunk in the spirit, whatever they say nowadays. Drunk on violence. Yeah, drunk on violence, exactly. But again, the Lord says, take heed to yourselves not to give in to all of these things. We're, it's very, especially now, money comes in, money goes out. But the times money comes in, oh, it's, it feels nice, doesn't it? Hey, why should we have to work so hard? Why are we going out preaching so much? Hey, we just relax. We don't need that much money, do we? There's not other brothers and sisters in the Lord who are dying right now in other countries. And you have the nerve to tell me we're going to be in a one bedroom? What? Oh, disgusting. And that's how you keep yourself from being drunk with the things of this world by remembering that there's brothers and sisters in other countries right now who are happy, who are married, who are loving life, and they can't even come up for their church. They can't go out. They can't witness. They can't do those things. None of it. And we're worried about when are we going to get the next best thing? When is this going to come out? Oh, I got a little bit of this on me or that. Try getting killed. Yeah. Can't get punched. Our brothers and sisters are dying and you can't get punched. Verse 36. Oh, well, well I'll read 35 then 6. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Amen. Does that include us too? All them that dwell on the face of the earth, these things are going to try us. Mm -hmm. Verse 36, and here's the last one. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Wait a minute, did the Lord say pray that we're worthy to escape from this nice cares of this life and this drink. I mean, how could this not be of God? Because it wastes your time. Hours on here, staying up late to watch this, to do that, be giddy, to talk so much, lazy, slothful, busy bodies and other man's affairs, and it might feel good to you, but the Lord says, pray that you don't fall into those things. Course. Yes, watch and pray. I have it resolved in my spirit to watch and pray to do all of these things, to take heed to not be deceived, terrified. I'm settling it in my heart. Patience to possess my soul. Look up and lift up your heads. Let not my heart be overcharged. Watch and pray. Resolve, Christian. Be resolved in your spirit to follow all the things of the Lord. You wonder why David can say things like, I'm not going to have anyone who's wicked serve me? Whoa, David's talking about serve me. Yeah, yeah serve you. Because David understands, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? Can you, Christian, walk in agreement with this world? You mean to tell me it's just all the time? All the time? I got to resist or rebel? Uh, if the Lord, from the very beginning, kicked out Satan, kicked out Adam and Eve out of, out of the garden mm -hmm. because they weren't resolved to enjoy all the things that God gave them righteously to have, then who are you? Have it resolved in your heart. So, again, I know this is a message that we have heard in different angles and different times inside of this church, uh, but I, I know it spoke to me when I was meditating on this to have things resolved. There's always going to be a resistance to what's evil 
and there's always going to be a rebellion, and at some point, it's going to be a revolt. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you that you continue to speak to us today, Lord, as we go from this sermon and we meditate on these things. I know I'll be meditating on them, Lord, that you teach us to number our days, Lord, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, not just our days, but our minutes, our hours, what we're sowing into these things. Father, I don't know if any of that uh, spoke to anyone here today, Lord. I know um, there could be an adjustment or just a repentance on something that uh, we're not resolved in when it comes to you, Father. But I just pray that you uh, speak to us. Go ahead and pray to the Lord, church, if, uh, about anything. all things, Lord. You have access to all things, Lord. You have access to our, our history on our phones. You have access to our time that we spend talking about pointless things. You have all access to everything, Lord, to our thoughts, to our hearts, to our motives. Yes, Father. To our possessions, Father, it's all yours. You have access to it all. Let us be resolved in your word, Lord, to stand before you, O Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll give one more scripture. Turn me back to him. We're running there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Oh, wait. No, Hebrews 12. Sorry. Hold on. Resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You know, almost all of us in this church have bled on outreach before, uh, but you might bleed again. <laughs> and you might bleed the first time because some crazy bottle gets thrown at you. And you must remember this scripture uh, that you need to continue to resist striving against sin. And most other people, that's when they quit. They go, ow, that hurt. And sometimes I bled and it didn't even hurt, which was a miracle. But the point is, he's, Paul is rebuking the Christians that read this and, and that they have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. If you don't strive against it there, and this is a theonomy scripture too, then, then of course you're not going to ever believe because you've never strived against it. You're just going to get run, run over. So if you strive against it, then, then at some point it's blood. And at some point, it's their blood. Don't always assume that word blood means your blood. <laughs> That's their blood too. Okay. If, I, if there was no cops around and I'm in a wrestling match with a homo that then turned into a knife fight, he might pull a knife. Okay. Then I am going to have to take care of him first. Okay. So... That's a great message, uh, Deacon James. Appreciate it. Turn that off. And uh, 